My name is Frank Horvat, and I am a composer, pianist, and music educator. There's a lot of my uh, compositional output and, and creative projects that are definitely related to um, social justice issues. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's very planned out and, you know, and other times it's just, you know, I watched something on the news and I was so moved by what I might have heard about or, or seen or read about that I just I felt like I had to compose something about that you know so uh, uh, I've been uh, you know it's sort of a weird thing to use your use your creative voice as a platform especially in a in a you know in our world of classical music you know it's sort of I f it sort of feels like sometimes it goes against that because you know classical music is a uh, so steeped in a, a tradition of uh, of conformity and tradition that it it sort of feels counterintuitive to use the same type of performing forces in order to to do that. But you know we live in the twenty first century and we have technology and and being able to combine. Um, electronic elements and other multimedia elements with the instrumentation that I love so much and that I feel is, you know, whether you play the piano or the violin or the cello or the flute or any, any instrument normally associated with classical music, I think music is music and, and these instruments and the singing voice as well, of course, has the ability to create such a wide array of emotions. So for me, it's always been a no brainer. Why would I not use music or these types of instruments as a platform in order to bring about awareness of things that I feel are important for the world to, to know more about and maybe learn more about or get inspired about uh, by not just hearing a politician make a speech and, you know, or hear some, you know, statistics or read a report or something like that. Music is a, it, for me, is a very abstract art. You know, even, even when you're writing or when I'm composing for a voice, um, and there's words. You know, uh, it still, it's, it's, it's just something that, you know, it doesn't matter what piece of music you listen to. You just hear a music piece of music, and, and it's this mysterious aura about this piece that touches your heart in such a way and you don't know why it's sort of like uh it's like asking why do two people fall in love i you know i can't answer that you know and it's the same thing i think music has that same type of unexplainable power on on people so i think that that that's why we have a special place as musicians you know we have a very special and unique uh place and a, and a special gift and a power you know, so um, I think that um, we live in a time in human history right now where there's a lot of things that are happening and is, you know, this is something I've been thinking about a lot and doing a lot of my music career even before COVID, you know, uh, climate change, for example, human rights issues. I mean, these are things that are going on, but there's something about this, the now, you know, with Me Too and and Black Lives Matter and, and now COVID. I think we are on a precipice where we can really evaluate and look at everything in our world. And as artists, it doesn't matter what your art form is, that um, I think, personally, I think we all have a duty as artists, no matter what you play or what you write or, or anything, we have an absolute duty to reflect the time that we live in. And, and this is not just based out of just me pulling this out of my hat. This has always been done, you know, uh, I go back in every point in history of art, you know, they always reflected the time in which they were living in. And um, for us not to create or not to perform things around this thing just feels like, well, then what are we doing here? You know, that's, right. you know, right. it just, it's a no brainer for me in that respect. Yeah, and I think it can it can speak to people like you said in such a in such a distinct and almost sometimes more subtle way. Like it can reach people in a way that talking at someone wouldn't. You know, just talking about an issue or we we hear all the time so much talking, talking all the time. The news and no. everybody is always talking at you. 
Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. I was I was watching a, a stand up comic last night on Netflix, yeah. and and he was just like he was just like he was giving life advice. His whole his whole bits, the whole act, and his all of his bits were about giving lo, you know life advice and you know in a very funny type of way. And one of his things was stop watching the news or just right. too much watching the news. It's on 24 hours a day. You will lose your mind. Stop it. It's just stop, stop, stop. And, you know, and it's just like, you know, that makes sense because, you know, I think, I think getting back to what I do is I feel I'm not, I don't want to use my music as a pulpit for this is what we need to do that that's what we need to do. A lot of my compositions have been around that. Um, not doing that. Uh, giving information, yes. But also just sharing a feeling and an idea. Um, my Probably one of my projects that I'm most proud of is, is two hour-long compositions that I composed the, uh, called Earth Hour, hour-long pian solo piano compositions, where I just invited people in an audience to come to a piano concert or this performance and just sit in the dark and listen to it. And of course, it's all based around, you know, um, energy conservation and, and thinking about renewable energy and climate change and so forth. But, you know, people, I didn't, I didn't tell people that's what you got to think. Just people showed up and they thought what they wanted and maybe they gave them a moment of clarity and you know, just thinking about their life personally, how do I fit into this greater world? You know, what am I doing here? These are, these are things that, that in our day and age, society and the mass media doesn't allow us to do anymore. You know what I mean? It's just like, we want to tell you what you should be thinking, you know? Well, we maybe, maybe as artists, that's, that's, we have, we can be more subtle with it because what we're dealing with is an abstract art. So we don't have to be so much in your face and, you know, let you make decisions on your own for that type of thing. I love that. Yeah. Because it, it does very much feel like, especially the political climate feels very polarized and very, um, again, with the talking and the, the people trying to convince each other what to feel. Absolutely. Yeah. I can't agree with you enough. It's, that's that's why what we do is special. I, that's why I love uh, visual art. You know, I love that one of my favorite, other than music, my, you know, I love all artistic disciplines, and I get so inspired by so many other artistic disciplines. But one of my favorite, without a doubt, is visual art. I mean, you could just sit and stare at a painting for an hour and take so many things out of it, and um, and it's what you're getting out of it, not what somebody told you you need to get out of it you know that's what I love about hearing from people I mean I create these pieces because it's a reflection of me and and what I'm you know what I'm thinking about what I'm feeling and and it's just sort of organically just comes out and I put it out there in the world and I just love getting this feedback from people and maybe you've had that same feeling too as a performer you did a concert and you know maybe in your mind you were sort of interpreting um, you had a backstory in your mind of what inspired you to perform the piece the way you do. And then somebody walks up to you and so excited and, and they're giving you a completely different backstory. But just to see that they had their own, you know, their own little relationship with you, isn't that, isn't that a special gift we have? We, we put these sound waves out there and then all of a sudden people just sort of like have their relationship with it. In essence, it almost has nothing to do with you even right. though you're the one who put it out there, you know? Right. Well, because everybody's coming from their own unique frame of reference of life experience, right? And it can connect in such a unique way. Exactly. Yeah. I feel very grateful that over the years, I've got many opportunities to share my music and, you know, and have conversations with audiences after a concert where either I perform my own composition or somebody else did or, or get emails afterwards. But there's been so many. I mean, actually, um, uh, one of them was actually where you're based now in Thunder Bay. I remember um, doing a concert, uh, playing a piano concert there. I played Earth Hour, the, that composition there about 10 years ago in concert. I remember this, this person uh, walked up to me and said, I was, you know, sitting in the dark, listening to this solo piano music in the dark. And and they were like, I'm a painter. And I was so inspired. I had visions in my head of, you know, of all these different scenes and that type of thing. And it's like, um, I'm going to go home and I'm going to paint something. 
And, and I was like, wow, that's so amazing. You know, that's so wonderful. And, and, you know, sometimes you get some very exuberant people you meet at concerts, you know, from different walks of life. And, you know, the, a lot of things are said and you don't, don't think of it. And then I got an email, lo and behold, a couple of days later with a picture of this beautiful canvas of, you yeah. know, this, this uh, moonlight, this moonlight with stars in the sky and everything. And it's just like, wow, you know, that person got all of this in their mind from sitting in a dark room, you know, with, with a bunch of other people, you know, uh, listening to piano music. I mean, how did that happen? You know, and things like that. And, you know, just, you know, people reminiscing or tears coming to their eyes. And, you know, I don't, I don't compose, I don't compose music to, my main motivation to compose music is not to get a reaction from people. You know, I, I'm not, that's not my thing. I, you know, I, when people ask me what kind of music you write, I, I usually say, I don't say classical music. I usually like saying art music because mm -hmm. art music is well, I'm the, I'm an artist and I write the music and it's a reflection of what I'm feeling and thinking. And then I put it out into the world, you know? So, so that for me is what an artist is. So I write art music then. Um, and so that's my prime motivation as a sort of way of therapy for myself, you know, just to get things off my mind and, and share and be able to, you know, bring things out of me of what I'm feeling and thinking. And, um, but then the bonus is obviously when you get these reactions from people, that's so beautiful, you know what I mean? And, uh, it's really neat. I feel blessed, you know, that I get that opportunity. It's like the cherry on top of the Sunday, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And that story about the painting is so cool. It's almost like there was, it was contagious. There's this translation somehow. And that's worked both ways, you Word know? Yeah translation that just then manifests in some other form right absolutely and it's worked the other way like i've i've experienced certain artwork that i was so inspired by that i was like oh well now i'm composing music on that i'm, I'm actually later this year later this fall i'm gonna have an album come out of that where i did a recording of a lot of different pieces and and all of them the one thing they all have in common with each other they were all inspired by some other piece of art not just visual art, but, you know, film or, or uh, literature and things like that. So I did a whole collection of that. And, and so that's been a big part of my life. And that's a beautiful thing about our creative world, right? And that's what I love about, there's so many bad things about the internet and the, the digital age, but gosh, how we connect with each other, right? You and I would have never connected with each other yeah. if it wasn't for the internet. I, we would never have known each other, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, social media and, and the web and, and things so yeah wow so true so i mean when you're composing sort of on themes like you know environmentalism or um, social change is that uh does that feel i don't know i can imagine that could feel difficult at times like do you have to kind of you must have to take breaks a lot of a lot of people know me for composing that kind of thing, and I'm proud of my my um, compositional output on on themes related to you know um, climate change or the environment or human rights, social justice stuff. You know, a lot of people know me for that, but but you're right, I I just don't compose that because if I just did, I, first of all, I'm, well, I'm way more interested in other things <laughs> than just that. And I'm also, um, like I said earlier, me, my compositional output is a reflection of all aspects of me, you know? So, um, so it's, it's that, and you're, you're right. I definitely uh, go, I go through phases where I'll compose a lot on those kinds of themes. And then other times I have to do something completely different for a while just to keep things fresh. You know, for me, uh, a big thing in my life too has been my personal battle with mental health issues. So, so for a long time, you know, dealing with depression and, and anxiety was a big challenge in my life. And, and to a certain extent it is still today, even though I'm in a much better place and I, I feel like I've got it much better under control um, these days, but, but, you know, to allow my music to reflect that part of my personality, 
you know, that was a big thing that really doesn't have a lot to do with, um, um, with climate change. Some of the things do, um, but, um, but they all sort of intertwine. And then sometimes I compose things that, you know, have no, you know, have no programmatic nature whatsoever. And, uh, and I love that stuff too, you know, just composing music just for the sake of experimentation. And, and uh, I've just composed something because I like the sonority of how two instruments or two melodic ideas match together. So let's do it. You know, I mean, anything goes, you know, Let, no limitations. We, we, we need to allow ourselves, um, we live in a world of abundance, so we have to treat our, our creative mind, you know, in that same type of mentality. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Do you do any meditation? Big time. Big time. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting this vibe from you. Like I, yeah, I do as well. So I often like feel a connection with. Okay. You're very astute for, for doing that. Cause I didn't even say it. So good for you for noticing, but okay. yeah, I, it's, it's in the, la I would say the last five years, my wife, um, really suggested that we start this as part of our everyday lives and ugh, typical me i'm i don't know what it is but i'm typically it, it a very personal thing i'm oh gosh i'm always resistant to change you mm -hmm. know a change of routine or whatever and so even that i was like oh i don't need it or blah 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 even though i was deal, you know going for therapy and you know trying to deal with with depression and stuff and my gosh that really changed my life big time you know i took a course uh took an online course in meditation and you know and then started the practice and basically most days i try to do it t um 15 minutes per day uh twice a day like once in the morning and once in the evening sometimes i'll do like one 30 minute session in the morning um and uh yeah it just it just keeps me grounded I, I i don't know about you but as artists you know we we're just constantly hustling and it's just constantly we go 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 and it's just like um it's it's infinite what we do we can constantly work on what we do every minute of the day and we still wouldn't get a chance to maybe cover everything that we would want to in order to further our career right and uh, or for me to write every piece that I have in my mind. So uh, it's so important that we just calm things down and, and just go within and let time stand still, so to speak, and, and tr you know, try not to think about anything or, or just meditate on something positive, you know, that, that can give us strength and keep us grounded. And I find that a lot of times these days I've been meditating on a lot of things around gratitude. Because I, I don't know about you, but uh, like this constant hustling, you know, I'm always forgetting. And I think this is partly to do with bad self-esteem, just a history of bad self-esteem. I, I forget that anything I accomplished, I just always, I forget, you know, it's like, um, you know, uh, it's like, you know, good response, winning award or, you know, getting grants, you know, being able to do projects, you know, um, album releases, positive reviews. It's just like, shoot, one ear out the other. And it's like, I sometimes just have to stop and give gratitude for what the world has given me. You know what I mean? You reaching out to me. I'm grateful that we're having this conversation today, you know, that you're interested in me. You know, that's something I should be celebrating or I need to celebrate. You know what I mean? How many times does a musician say the term, I am not good enough? We, every human being has a limit, right? So we all, but as musicians, we're so vulnerable to rejection. We often say, well, I'm not good enough. You know what I mean? I'm not, I haven't played, you know, violin concerto with the New York Philharmonic. So I'm obviously, I haven't been invited so to play with them. So obviously I'm not good enough. You know what I mean? How often do we say that? Constantly, you know what I mean? And so I've been, I wrote a blog post recently about how we have to take the term, I am not good enough and just delete the words, not good. Mm -hmm. And what are you, what are you left with? I am enough. And that's it. You know what I mean? If you're doing things with open heart and love and, and passion, um, who cares, who cares what, 
what happens? You know what I mean? If, if something great happens and you get notoriety and that kind of thing, then uh, great. But, you know, if you just do it with an open heart and put it out there and share who you are, then I'm a firm believer that good things have ha will happen. And what's so ironic is that in the last five or six years where I've really conquered that for my own inner self, since I've conquered that, I find that, um, ironically, I'm getting so much more notoriety for what I'm doing. The moment I, the moment I stopped caring about what the world thinks of me or am I good enough, you know, and just thought, oh, just be the, just be the best musician, person, composer, son, you know, husband, friend, just be the best person you can be in all aspects of your life. And if you do that, good things will happen. The moment I started to believe that and not care about results, you know what I mean? Then poof, it actually happened. You know, the abundant world started giving me a lot. You know, if right place, right time, if the world and the stars aligned you to give something to somebody else or you know, express something to something else, and they just happen to need it at that point. Mm -hmm. Great, it will happen. You know, you 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 did your you did an audition. They wanted that the type of sound you gave at that very moment. That's exactly what they needed for your orchestra. We're hiring her. You know what I mean? I I pitched a composition. Uh, I did this earlier this week. With um, with an ensemble, I have a I have a concept in my mind for um, for a composition I'd like to do and a project I'd like to do. And I sent an email last week to an ensemble here in Toronto that I really like and I think they're awesome. And I could see them doing a great job with this. And uh, you know, so I sent them a detailed email with how I'd like to collaborate with them. And boom, they got back to me yesterday. We had this wonderful hour, two hour long, you know, Zoom call talking about all the plans and, and just right place, right time. Like that's exactly what they were thinking they, they would like to do and they need, right? So it's such a wonderful concept. And it's like I said, it's a world of abundance. You know, I think we, a lot of people can be their worst enemy because they're just like, well, because they're so afraid of rejection that, you know, if you don't put anything out there, then, you know, sure, you won't get rejected, but you won't move forward either for what you'd like to do. So, uh, so th the rejection is, uh, you know, so hard, but, but you need to get 10 rejections to get the one or two, you know, things. And then you just focus on the one or two things that were positive results and, you know, we survive, right? So... Yeah. And I find like, do you find too, like the more you open your mind to that, the more it comes to the more to absolutely. Just, right. I mean, do you believe in the law of attraction? Is that a, yeah. yeah, me too. You know, I've, I was very skeptical. I watched that movie, the secret. I have a really, <laughs> I have a really good friend who is a actor and a director and he's a very passionate about the law of attraction and he's like took me out for lunch one day and he was like he spent two hours just telling me about the law of attraction and, and you know after listening to him talk about it and you know seeing you know doing workshops and you know seeing that film and so forth it's like heck yeah this this really does happen you you put whatever energy you put out into the world that's what you're gonna get back what goes around comes around for sure. What would you say to meditation skeptics or people who are kind of like intimidated by it or have tried it and it hasn't worked for them? Yeah, well, I think I think you got to figure out what specific practice works for you. You know, for me, uh, my my meditation often is a mantra based meditation. I'm thinking about a particular mantra and I'm focusing on that. And, uh, but it doesn't have to be that. And I think you have to really explore. And by the way, for me, meditation isn't, you know, um, meditation doesn't have to be, you know, say it sitting in some yogic pose or, or whatever, or, you know, in being in some beautiful place in nature, overlooking, you know, a beautiful, uh, 
you know, sand or beach or whatever as the ocean goes gently. It can be anywhere, anytime. I've meditated on, on a, you know, in the TTC here in Toronto, you know, uh, with, you know, just shutting out the world around me and just, you know, just calming myself and, and taking deep breaths and, and so forth. So I think you have to find that. And for people who are, are religious and believe in a, and practice a particular faith, prayer is a form of meditation. There is these this sort of stereotype of how it should be, uh, you yeah. know, how how one is supposed to. I mean, the traditional Zen Buddhist way, I guess, would be to sit cross-legged and have your hands a certain way, and all of these things. But I think that's that can feel kind of unattainable, especially for a beginner, and for myself too. Um, and there's so many ways that a person can embody meditation and use it in their life you know I mean one of the things I think you you might relate to this too is when you have anxiety it's really really hard to sit still and the the um the idea of having to clear your mind is I mean next to impossible like that seems like a feat that's just uh almost cruel to <laughs> expect yourself to yeah. do and I think that's also a, a bit of a misconception because the meditations that I've always enjoyed the most when I was going to temple in Ottawa for example um, were always the ones where we actually had to focus on a specific objective and like hold a focus as opposed to clear you know exactly because then it, it, you know it's like like when you have a student you don't want to be telling someone what not to do you want to be telling them what to do it's much clearer for the brain to understand, you know, this is what you should do rather than this is what you should not be thinking about. You know, I agree. The minute you try not to think about something, it all comes. So, and, and you know what? I completely agree with you. And I think that's the beauty of meditation. Sometimes you can have a meditation where it's, it's based on, I want to clear my mind. And then sometimes it's like, I want to focus on a particular, I want to, how many times have you heard somebody say, after you had a conversation, I'm going to go meditate on that. You know, right, that's wonderful. Right. That's wonderful because then you can really think clearly about something that's important in your life and so forth. The one thing, the one thing that I had to really overcome in my meditation practice is not beating myself up if I my mind started to race. You know, what I mean, like, it, like meditation is like anything else in daily life, like playing our instruments, right? We have good days playing where we can't play any wrong notes and everything is absolutely perfect. And then there's other days where it feels that like we can't play anything right, you know, and it's like, you know, and meditation is the same way. It's a practice, right? It's a practice. It's a, it's a way of life. And some days you're going to have more clarity. You're going to have more of the, you know, the Zen, the, the clear mind, and other days, you it's just constantly fighting it. So uh, the, I think that's where people I talk to get into trouble. They're like, well, I can't do it. I'm starting to think about my kids, my bills, my doing the groceries, whatever. Well, yeah, then if you beat yourself up, of course, you're going to have a negative thing about it. So don't beat yourself up. Just like, oh, well, I'll just do it again tomorrow. For me, that's why I love meditation. I, I don't know why I was so reticent of it, because people like us, we grew up we love routine, you know? We have not gotten where we've gotten to in our career without practicing X amount of hours a day since a very young age, you know? I love routine, because that's how I've been wired since I was five years old, right? Just practicing this instrument, you know, day in, day out. So meditation is the same thing for me. You just do it, and some days it's great, and other days, but it's just a regular part of my day, like practicing, like brushing my teeth, like cooking. It's just, I just treat it like that. And in a way, I mean, in a way, showing up is enough, right? Exactly. Like showing up is enough. If you sat, if you've done the sitting or you've done the, the lying down, I think another thing that people don't realize is like, you know, if your back's uncomfortable and that's all you're thinking about, just lie down. Yeah, exactly. Or, or, you know, or like the, actually what I've realized lately is like walking meditation has been really, really good. It depends what your goal is, right? But if what you're practicing is mindfulness or watching the thoughts or any of that sensory awareness anything like that I mean it can it can be done in all kind in my opinion it could be done in all kinds of um, unorthodox ways <laughs> so absolutely anything goes I think even we can meditate when we play our instruments too 
you know, I think improvisation has a, little, uh, has a, a huge benefit. Um, sound healing has become a, a wonderful thing that I've started to explore and, and meet people who are very much into sound healing. I think this is, uh, as musicians, especially in a classical realm, I think there's a, there's a whole area there where we can really marry together what we do as musicians and, and, and uh, explore more of our creativity and also make it therapeutic for ourselves and anybody else who's listening. So, yeah. oh, well, that's cool. That's cool to talk about that. Um, okay. So tell me about your upcoming album. It's or one of your big COVID projects, I'm guessing. Yeah, well, uh, I pretty well, it's the one big COVID project. Uh, I mean, I've been trying to work on other things, but oh gosh, the past year has been crazy with this thing, like for all of us, right? I mean, just like it's, as we're talking right now, it's been, it's been pretty well exactly a year when everything shut down and, and this craziness began. And, you know, and I don't know about you, but for me, last March was, was crazy. You know, I was just like, I had all these things lined up uh, for the rest of the calendar year, uh, traveling uh, to different parts, I had engagements lined up in, in I had a premiere was supposed to happen in Ecuador of a composition I was going to go. It was, we bought the plane tickets. It was already booked. Uh, things in Europe later last summer. Um, it was a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. A Banff, I was going to go to Banff for a month long uh, uh, residency. So just, you know, when everything went down and everything just got shut down, I, I just felt, you know, you know, I, I felt a little bit of mix, you know, I felt sad or disappointed because I was really looking forward to all these opportunities. But I also, you know, again, gratitude, I, I felt, okay, well, I have my health and I have my family's healthy and we're safe and uh, income wise, I can keep teaching, you know, I could still see, see my students. So the whole teaching on Zoom thing has popped up. So, you know, compared to a lot of other people right now, I have it quite good. So, uh, but I still felt that being said, even though I was feeling those things about myself personally, I felt like this void. Um, just like I mentioned earlier, often a lot of my compositions are based around reflecting the time in which I live. Well, just poof, all of a sudden, here's this thing that's really reflected our time. You know, COVID has instantly become this thing that will forever become part of this generation, whoever lived at this time, their, their lives, you know. And I thought, what am I going to compose? What can I do? At the same time, nobody's, there's no concerts. I mean, what am I going to do? And I, and I just felt so sorry and felt that for all of my colleagues where everything was all of a sudden canceled and people didn't, you know, I've seen posts on social media. I don't know where I'm going to get income. I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, people are like scrambling. I got to try to think outside the box to, you know, to do concerts online so I can keep being relevant and stay in the eye of my, my community of, um, you know, people who follow me musically. And I thought, okay, well, I love composing. Um, why don't I just start composing on this idea of being in self-isolation? Because that's something every single person is doing right now. So that's, that's basically how it started late, uh, last March. I, I, I decided one Sunday morning walking along the Creek close to our house. I said, what if I started composing one short piece per day for a different instrument or voice every day? And I compose it in the morning and I post it in the afternoon the sheet music, I, it's like two minutes, around two minutes. And it's the music is inspired by the theme of being in self-isolation, both the good and the bad, you know, and then just put it out there for free and the sheet music out for there for free. And if anybody wants to play it, you know, go ahead, play it, uh, you know, do a video on YouTube, whatever, do it a virtual performance. Well, I I just did this as a thing to keep busy, and before I know it, it just completely blew up. At this at this point, we've had over 150 videos of various musicians from around the world um, uh, playing them in virtual concerts and so forth, and and I ended up composing a piece pretty well every day for a month, and I ended up composing 31 pieces, 
in the Music for Self-Isolation Suite. And it basically, name an instrument, it's represented in this suite. Most of them are there. And voice, quite a few, uh, we had even five, five of the 31 pieces are voice pieces. Um, and so it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience this past year. And then, of course, what happened then is uh, we had spin-off things of it. I did some audio documentary compositions where I interviewed some of the musicians that were on it talking about what life has been like for co during the time of COVID. So rather than it just being about, oh, you know, here's some pieces to play about, you know, self-isolation. Let's talk to you about, get more in depth, like what you do with your awesome podcast, you know? So I, I did it, you know, and, and edited it together into these, these things. And then, um, and then the opportunity came along to record the record, all the pieces. And so in, uh, we got the funding to do that. And then we started hunting around for a place to record. And we normally, when I record an album, I go to recording studios that I love here in Toronto and I, I, it's a great place to record. But I thought, this is something special. What if we were to do something poignant and have a single musician recording their piece, but in a big, empty, large concert hall, both for the beautiful acoustic, you know, of these, these the lovely instruments, which just make these solo pieces sound just musically would be great. But also just the symbolic poignancy of, you know, there's nobody here. And you're playing in this room all by yourself about these pieces about being in self-isolation. So I just love the, uh, the artistic concept of that. And well, that took off and uh, we got Roy Thompson Hall interested. And so we ended up recording the album in January on three days. And then we recorded on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then the provincial government announced a further stricter lockdown on the Thursday. We were already wearing masks, social distancing. The crew at Lake at Roy Thompson Hall was amazing. They were cleaning up, like constantly washing. Everybody had separate warm-up areas that were being disinfected. It was it was quite a quite a just a logistical organizational craziness. But nevertheless, the next day the, the lockdown happened and we would have not been able to do it. So if we didn't finish the recording, then it would have not been done. And now we fast forward to the present and the album is going to come out on April the 9th. And we're even having a documentary shot about the whole thing where the musician, more musicians were interviewed. It's going to be intermingled with their, with their performance at Roy Thompson Hall. It's just, it's just been an awesome platform, this whole project to, to share and like I said earlier, if my goal in life is to to be relevant to the world I which I live in, I'm so grateful that this project just on a whim on a Sunday morning walk a year ago just popped into my head. And now it's just sort of it has a life of its own. And I'm so proud of that because it's it's more than just about me. You know, it has really nothing to do with about me anymore. It's just about creating community and and that type of thing. And I think that's what we really need right now. I miss not seeing people in person, but this is the next best thing to have something collectively as a music community we can work on together, so. That's so great. Well, I'm really looking forward to hearing it and watching that documentary too. That's super cool. Thank you, yeah. thank you, yeah. Well, I don't wanna take up too much more of your time, but I really wanna thank you for um, speaking to me today. It was a pleasure getting to know you a bit better. Same here, Marlena. I really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, hopefully we can connect again in person um, at some point soon. And uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing that and hearing the upcoming projects. That's for sure. And uh, please stay in touch. I really appreciate you inviting me on again. And uh, you never know if the stars align right. Like I said earlier, we can think of a project to work on, maybe musically. We, it would be great to uh, to uh, to think about that as well. So. Yeah.